I'm John Carter in Moscow, in Havana, Cuba. Now in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. I'm John Carter in Petra, right here in communist China, reporting from India. Hi, I'm John Carter in the Solomon Islands. I'm John Carter in Soweto, from El Salvador. I'm John Carter in Sydney, Australia. John Carter explores our liberties threatened. Welcome back to the Carter Report. Our guest today is attorney Alan Reineck, and we're talking about religious liberty threatened here in the United States of America. Thank you for joining us, Alan. It's our privilege and our pleasure to have you with us today. Now, you were talking uh, in our last segment about the mark of the beast, which is a big threat in the last days. Correct. Can I just give you and the audience a little scenario? It's believed by most evangelicals that the great time of trouble or the great tribulation happens after the rapture. So all the saints go home to glory. How convenient. Oh, oh, I mean, Miss it's, all it's, the fireworks. I mean, it's... it's <laughs> It's extremely comforting. I can't go along with it, though, because I can show texts in the Bible in Matthew 24 where Jesus talks about this great tribulation. Then he says, after the tribulation of those days, the sun is going to be darkened, the moon's not going to give us light, the stars are going to fall from heaven. Then Jesus is going to come. And so I believe that this great time of persecution is going to happen before the return of Christ. So, you know, John, many times those of us who work in religious liberty, we've been asked, why are we working for religious liberty when we know persecution has to come before Jesus comes? Yes. And after all, don't we want Jesus to come? Yes. Um, one of my colleagues uh, used to be, who's, who's from Switzerland, he used to be fond of telling people, you know, brother, Dear sister, <laughs> if, you, if you want the persecution to come before Jesus returns, there are many fine countries I can recommend to you right now. Yes. Uh, you can have all the persecution you want. Yeah, most of us don't, don't know about so this. We're here in America, and, yes. and we're really far removed from the fact that literally, literally 80% of the global population live in nations with little or no religious freedom. There is persecution of religious minorities, Christians, Muslims, others, in most countries of Name the world. Name some of them. Well, some of the worst offenders you know, uh, for example, North Korea. And Saudi Arabia. Uh, the uh, All across the Arab no, world. No synagogues in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a yeah. big offender. And but no throughout, Christian churches. Throughout. Pakistan. Yes. You know, we just uh, got the, the word, uh, the Christian lady, Asia Bibi, was released after years of being yeah, imprisoned for uh, falsely accused of blasphemy against the prophet. Mm -hmm. um, blasphemy laws yeah, it was are a, a big false problem. Accusation. In China, there's a, a re education campaign uh, complete with camps for one million Uyghur Muslims in, in China. A million of them. And yes, that's what the reports are. Mm. And, and you know, Chinese good, Christians a good communist are government. being persecuted as well. Mm. So when I mean, you talk about the big, the big offenders, uh, uh, we could go on and on. Now, I've been to Russia 49 times and in Ukraine. Run lots of campaigns there, Alan. You don't want to be a Jehovah's Witness in Russia right now. Tell us about the Jehovah Witnesses in Russia. Well, they were literally outlawed yes, as an were. organization. Uh, recent reports, they're starting Vicious. to be arrested now. They're viciously persecuted. Yes. All of their churches, all their buildings, their kingdom halls, illegally seized. Right. And many of the leaders thrown into prison because they're Jehovah Witnesses. Do you believe in the teachings of Jehovah Witnesses? I'm not a Jehovah's Jehovah Witness. I no. believe in their right to have their beliefs. Absolutely. And their right to promote their beliefs. Absolutely. I don't have to agree with them. No, absolutely. <laughs> but in Russia, uh, unfortunately today we see a, a tendency where Russia is going back to the bad old days of the Soviet Union. Well, you know, uh, Forgive me, but uh, President Trump's buddy, uh, Mr. Putin there, yes. is a former KGB chief. So, yes, he is. You know, uh, 
What I do you know, expect? I know. What do you expect? Let me read you this passage, Alan. Out of the Apocalypse, as you said, rightly so, it was written by a Jewish gentleman. Yes, indeed. So uh, let me read you something here. Uh, in Revelation 13, you have a symbolic portrayal of two beasts or two latter-day world powers. Uh, the first one we, we won't go into, but the second one says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. It two horns like a lamb spoke like a dragon. This is a power that comes up very nice like a lamb, but ends up speaking like a dragon. This is not preached on too much today, Alan, because it's too controversial. Then it goes on to say, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. The first beast was a union of church and state. Yes, it was. And a persecuting power. Indeed. Causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And it goes on to say this, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth, here it is, and, and listen to this, my friend, to make an image to the beast, an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Now, if I say to you, Alan, as I said in the first segment, uh, your son or your daughter, hey, just the image of you, Alan. Mm-hmm. Spitting image. What does it mean? It means he looks just like me. Yeah, acts like you. That's a scary thought, isn't it? It is. <laughs> There's an, one of me is quite enough. <laughs> and one of you two for that matter, John. <laughs> this is why you and I get on so well together. Yeah. So the image of the beast is the copy. The image of the beast is the copy of the beast. Yeah. And the beast was a union of church and state. Well, the beast exercised all the authority of both civil and religious authority. And now the second beast will also become a mirror image of the first one by exercising not just secular civil authority like all nations do, but religious authority as well. Now, some of us believe who've been studying these prophecies, I've been studying these prophecies, dare I tell you, for 60 years. Now, you, you, you could never guess that. I know that, Alan. But <laughs> I've been studying these prophecies for a lifetime. And we believe that this scenario is going to happen right here in the United States of America, the bastion of freedom. What was the genius of the First Amendment, attorney? Well, I think it's, uh, it's portrayed symbolically here in this passage where it talks about having two horns like a lamb. The lamb in Scripture is a symbol of Jesus. Yes. And mild, innocent, mm. and horns are a symbol of power. So the symbolism of the United States coming up as a nation with two horns like mm. a lamb mm. is we have in our Constitution two types of separation. We have uh, and neither one of them is the phrases are not used in the Constitution. We don't have a phrase in the Constitution that says separation of powers. But what the Constitution does is divide power among Congress and the Supreme Court and the presidency, the executive branch. So we have three branches of government. We also have a division of power. And it's a great power. system, isn't it? Uh, when it works, it is. It, it's you a know, great system. Um, democracy is the worst a form of government known to man except for every other one. Said Churchill. <clears throat> well, Churchill's pretty pretty bright guy, mm -hmm. uh, even if he was a Brit. Yes. Mm. Um, and, of course, we also <laughs> have separation between state and local government and federal government. Mm. Each has their sphere. And the genius was uh, preventing too much accumulation of power. Now, we have had what's known as the imperial presidency with too much accumulation of power under both Republican and Democratic administrations. So, so there's enough blame to go around, isn't there? It's uh, certainly enough yeah. to go. But when you talk about 
these two horns like a lamb, it's not just the separation of civil authority, it's also the separation of church and state, which is not what the First Amendment says, it's what the First Amendment does. Just like the Constitution doesn't say separation of powers, but that's what it does. So that's the genius of America, isn't it? It is. Yes. But I, I want to point out one more thing. This business of speaking like a dragon. Yes. Uh, many who read this casually think, oh, well, that's going to be in the future. And, and it certainly will be. But the text, uh, the tense of this passage uh, in the Greek refers to action that began in the past. It's imperfect, which means it was never completed. It's continuing into the present and on into the future. So both the principles of the horns like a lamb and the dragon speaking, this has been the tension in our nation's history, in our national life, the tension between our aspirations towards freedom, our, our, the equality of, of all human beings has been largely aspirational. And yet we also have lots of things we could point to that are dragon-like in our history. Let me ask uh, what could be called a, a controversial question. <laughs> You'd never ask a controversial question. So. Uh, not to a controversial... It's out of character for uh, you, John. Not to a controversial attorney. Do you see the image of the beast being set up in America today? Absolutely. You, you really do? I do. Look. I'm not talking now, this is sort of a bombshell, the image of the beast, because this is the this is one of the last signs before the coming of Christ. Look. And it's a scary thing. We understand the image of the beast to be a nation that is exercising both civil and religious authority. Yes. Okay. Mm. So with the you know, you okay, you've seen from this administration uh, persistent criticism of the press of our major newspapers, et cetera. Is that dangerous attacking, or is it true? Attacking the media. Is it true though? Doesn't the press deserve a lot of this? I don't think so. You don't think so? The press is the fourth estate. It is the institution that is supposed to hold elected officials' but, feet to but, the fire. But, but you and I know that the liberal press in this country has done untold damage to the Christian cause. The press is largely reflective of the views of the far left. Is, is that so? I would not agree with that. Uh, uh, no, I'm asking a question. The press is secular. Uh, most of the reporters are unchurched, and so they may not be uh, you know, sympathetic to um, the church, but that doesn't mean that they're attacking the church. No, no, but they have, in my humble opinion, shown a bias towards liberal causes. I think the press works very hard to tell it like it is. Um, they should, but they are, as, as you say, they're being called what? Enemies of the people. Yeah, is that a new term? No, it's not. We heard the same thing during the 1930s in Germany, didn't yeah, we? I did some study on this last night, knowing that I'd be interviewing you, Alan. <laughs> And the term the enemy of the people even goes back to the days of the French Revolution. Uh, not talking so much about the press, but anybody who, who was um, seen as being uh, in, in, with a different viewpoint to the government. And so in the days of the French Revolution, anybody who was against the government was an enemy of the people. It was a term that was used by, by Hitler and a term that was used by Stalin and a term that was used by Lenin. You so know, it's a little, little bit bad, but, isn't it? That connotations. If, if I may here, there is a twisting when, you know, in our Declaration of Independence, mm -hmm. we, we talk about, um, well, or the, in the Constitution, we talk about we the people in order to form a more perfect union. You know, Lincoln's phrase, government of, by, and for the people mm. and people having God-given inalienable rights and the yes. role of government is to respect and to protect the rights of the people. Yes. When you then identify the government as the people so that if you are in <laughs> opposition to the government, yes. your opposition to the people, 
that's a complete distortion. Uh, it's, it is. It's 180 degrees. Yes. You know, the people are supposed to hold the government to account. Yes, not the other way around. Right. Uh, I've just discovered a statement here. I've forgotten I had it. Lenin said, all leaders of the Constitutional Democratic Party, now, this was not the same as the Democratic Party in America, I should point yes. this out. All leaders of the Constitutional Democratic Party, a party filled with enemies of the people, are hereby to be considered outlaws. So the very term is, is an obnoxious term, is it not? And it's a, it's a, a dangerous term. And what, what the people did there, Stalin did, Lenin did, they imprisoned and they executed people who were the enemies of the people. They were dissidents. They were good people. But you were, you were asking me about the image of the beast. Yes. And where, where I was going with this. Yes was to suggest that the danger is when the government starts to uh, assume to itself the right to choose among religions, yes. to favor one, yes. and to disfavor others. Yes. Now, in our country, uh, we have decided that we will disfavor the Islamic religion, and we will restrict the rights of of people of the Muslim faith who want to come to this country, even if they're married to American citizens. Uh, and there have been a so number of- So that's really unconstitutional, isn't it? Well, the courts are gonna have to ultimately decide on, on you know, that, but it certainly, I mean, we might as well cut off the head of the Statue of Liberty or send the whole thing back to France because uh, we've, we've really uh, changed our whole view of what our nation is about. Instead of being a, a nation welcoming peoples, the oppressed peoples of the world, we're now saying, no, we don't want you. You're from toilet bowl countries and you don't have the same religion or the same skin color that we do. Go home. Do you think it, it is because of ignorance of what America stands for? Do you think people have forgotten about the Constitution, the Bill of Rights? Do you think they've forgotten about uh, persecution? Because Americans were born and bred in the concept of freedom of religion. Because America came, America became America to escape the first beast, there's the union always, of church and state. There's always been a tension, John, in our country between the two principles, the freedom to believe as I do mm -hmm. and the freedom to believe as you do. Yes. Now, our, the genius of our country is extending freedom to everyone to believe differently from one another, but too many Americans, uh, really the dominant view of religious liberty in this country is simply the freedom to believe as I do, which is to say, as long as you agree with me, uh, you know, I'll defend your right to be free. But if you disagree with me, we don't want you here. You know, we don't like your kind around here. Uh, now, I want to say to the great audience uh, who is watching today, what Alan is saying is old-fashioned American patriotism, in my opinion. Thank you. I think you're an, an American patriot. I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> you said by me. No. <laughs> no, you're an American patriot. Well, uh, do you find yourself uh, lonely these days? Well, of course. Of course? Yeah. But you belong to a church that believes in these things and the separation of church and state. You belong to a church that okay. says that the Look, church ought to stay out of the state and vice separation versa. Separation of church and state in America is a fundamentally Protestant idea. It was championed by all of the Protestant churches yes. until segregation was removed by the Supreme Court and all of a sudden uh, separation of church and state was attacked because the churches started establishing private schools and instead of you know wanting to deny public funding to the catholic schools now they wanted public funding for their own schools yes. and they because they're in, they needed to have their own uh, segregated schools hmm. to be all white and they wanted government funds and so they started attacking the separation of church and state 
It's been a radical transformation of the Protestant ethos so that religious Christian conservatives today have been fed a, a steady diet of propaganda attacking the separation of church and state for 30 or 40 this years. This is amazing, isn't it? I mean, this is quite incredible because when I was a boy growing up in Australia, I was taught over and over again that America stood for the separation of church and state. We did. You know, uh, and then we had the Bill of Rights, which I memorized, and the First Amendment. And let me tell you something funny. I've asked big congregations, tell me about the First Amendment. Is anybody here can say the First Amendment? In my congregations, I couldn't find a single person. High school students that <laughs> have already had some kind of government class they could tell me all the members of the Simpsons family from the cartoon show on yes. TV, but they couldn't tell me what rights were protected under the First Amendment. And this is the great tragedy, isn't it? It is. It is the tragedy of, of ignorance. But I'm appealing today to the audience and I'm appealing to every person watching the program to stand up for America, for what America used to stand for. Our principles that we have all aspired to, principles of freedom for all, mm. are powerful and they've been a beacon, a light to yes, the nations have. of the world. Yes. And are they so today? Well, it's, it's much more difficult. As I've talked to human rights and religious freedom advocates who work overseas, um, when we have an America first foreign policy uh, and when the rhetoric coming out of our country is attacking other countries, attacking people of other faiths, attacking immigrants, you know, it's simply inconsistent with our advocacy of human rights and religious freedom. It undermines our effectiveness. Uh, I sometimes feel a very lonely person, Alan, because I'm not on the left and I'm not on the right. I'm uh, accused of being one or the other, but well, I am I'm not. Accused, I'm accused of all sorts of things. <laughs> I don't belong to any political party. Nor do I. Uh, and I've been accused of this. No, you've, I was accused this weekend. You've got to take your stand and you've got to stand with these people. I, I've said, well, I stand with Jesus. I'm an independent. I plan to stay an independent. Uh, I don't want to offend you, my dear friend and supporter of the Carter Report, but I've got to be honest with you. I don't want other people thinking for me. I don't want to belong to a party, then I'm forced into this little groove. And they tell you what to think and yeah. how to... I reserve the right to think for myself and to follow Christ. And not in that order, but to follow Christ. And Jesus said, didn't he say, you'll know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. Yeah, a lot of people today are not free. A lot of people are tied up and they can't think for themselves. And they're simply thinking other people's thoughts and they're getting brainwashed. And this is what concerns me. Now, it says here, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. That's the copy of church and state. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not, listening, would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So it says intolerance is going to become so strong in America that people are going to be put to death over the issue of the separation of church and state and to whom is your allegiance? Those who belong to God, who receive the seal of God yes. and who do not worship the beast, who are not in allegiance to the nation, they're the ones who are going to be on the outs. It says here, absolutely, Alan. It says, he causes us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the beast. And so they're going to be a very big group of people, aren't they? Because they're conformists. Mm -hmm. They go along with the crowd. They go along to get along. Now, Alan, we're running out of time, and this has been a great program. What you've said is, I, I think, is tremendous. And I urge the viewers to think about what you've heard here today and to think for yourself. Don't be a slave to any system. Uh, please write to me, John Carter, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. 
in Australia, you can write to me at the address at, uh, on the screen at Terrigal in New South Wales. Write to me. And uh, this is a limited time offer because we can't do this forever. Uh, if you write today and if you support the great cause of freedom, we'll send you a copy of this talk. We'll send you the DVD. Alan, have the final word. I just think it's really important that we find our hope and our faith in Christ and mm. not put our, I think the message of Revelation is to fear God, to, to reverence Give glory God, to him, yeah. Because it's gonna be judgment day. And ultimately, are we putting our trust in God or are we relying on the powers that be, on the state? That's really where the, the rubber meets the road. Um, and I found, I'm not quite as old as you are, John, but in my several know? decades uh, of walking with yes, Christ, yes. Uh, we've been through the fire and he's always sustained me. Alan, it's been a great honor and a privilege to have you with us today because you're the voice for freedom. It's been a privilege having you with us today. And remember what the Bible says, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. God bless you. Greater Manila is more than 20 million souls. Almost all these beautiful people are ignorant of the true gospel of Christ. Manila needs Jesus. 35 years ago, John Carter came to Manila. Pastor Carter is returning to Manila with an urgent assignment. Preach the gospel of Christ and the great truths of the Bible. Don't water down the message. Make it plain, make it clear, make it Christ-centered. The Carter Report needs your help now to light a fire in the Philippines. Your gift will help open the doors of bondage, smash the chains of sin, and open the gates of paradise to thousands of lost souls. The churches have sent out an urgent plea for the Carter Report to return. Help us proclaim the true gospel of Christ to the beautiful Filipino people. Please send your support to the address on the screen, visit our website, or call the Carter Report. The word began in a village. Churches and schools sprang up and multiplied, reaching into the city. Great truths revealed to the people of Papua New Guinea, changing thousands of lives. Our eyes are going to be opened to the discovery of amazing truths. The greatest truth in the Bible, it is the truth that God loves you. It has completely changed my life, and I'm going to be baptized this Sabbath. Pastor Kata has put something in my heart that I will never forget. Thank you, Pastor Kata, for your program. It has changed my life completely. John Carter's Great Truths Revealed was recorded live from Papua New Guinea. Experience the miracles in this 21 DVD series for a gift of $150 US or $210 Australian. To order, visit our website or call. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.